Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. This is David Shoemaker, and I'd like to welcome you to Living to Lima. Now, this is one of those episodes, in fact, a series of episodes that uh, was always inevitable uh, for me um, to do. Uh, we're going to be focusing on Kabbalistic psychology in a, a much more detailed and uh, in-depth way than we've done here and there in past episodes. For example, I've talked about Kabbalistic coping skills, and I've talked about the, in various ways, in p bits and pieces, the, the so-called parts of the soul uh, in, of Kabbalistic psychology. But today, and in the ensuing episodes, we're really going to go much more in, in depth. Um, most importantly, uh, what I'm going to strive to do here is show not just uh, the the facts about Kabbalistic psychology and and um, you know the names of the parts of the soul and what they represent and all of that, but try to give you a sense of why this is important for a Thelemic magician to understand at all. In fact, for any magician or anyone aspiring to understand the way to apply Kabbalah to their own inner life. I think uh, Kabbalistic psychology is a set of uh, terms and a uh, set of dynamics, dynamic processes that are really essential to understand if we want to fully grasp what Kabbalah can be for us and utilize it in our magical path, in our path of inner development and spiritual attainment. So over the course of this episode and the next three, I'm going to cover um, an introduction. I'm going to be, that's what today is going to be. I'm going to be talking about uh, the system of Kabbalistic psychology overall. And then um, for the next three episodes, we'll be focusing on uh, an individual part uh, of the soul. Uh, in particular, we'll cover Nefesh, and then Ruach, and then Neshama. And of course, I'll be defining these terms uh, today, to get you started, I want to point out that on livingthelema.com, on the resources page, uh, I've added a new link for this series of episodes to some diagrams that I think will be really useful in uh, helping you understand what we're talking about here today. So there's two links. One is for the Kabbalistic parts of the soul um, image, and then another is for the Jungian model of the of the psyche. On both of these images, the uh, the model that we're discussing is superimposed on the tree of life so that you can see how there is a, a direct relationship to the Sephiroth and uh, the paths and uh, the processes that you may be a little bit more familiar with just from processes and terminology that you may be a little bit more familiar with from uh, your studies of Kabbalah in the past. If you uh, need a basic primer on Kabbalah itself, you might want to um, look at the first chapter in Living Thelema as an overview, but there are certainly a lot of other uh, books out there and other resources for understanding the Tree of Life and just getting uh, basically introduced to those terms. So with that in mind, let's uh, get started. Um, now, I said this was an inevitable episode for me, uh, and you know, most of you probably know I'm a psychologist and uh, obviously uh, interested in Kabbalah. So the fact that I'd be especially interested in exploring the overlap is a no-brainer. But um, it goes deeper than that for me because really Kabbalistic psychology was my entryway into Thelema itself and into uh, an explicit exploration of the magical path. Way back when I was in graduate school, I tell this story in the introduction to Living Thelema, but it's uh, worth touching on a little bit here. I was in graduate school and, and studying um, what was presented in graduate school at the time in clinical psychology um, in most mainstream schools, which is, you know, an overview of primarily cognitive behavioral uh, approaches. We would do... Um, surveys of all kinds of different theoretical orientations to therapy, uh, such as classical Freudian and behavioral and Jungian and Adlerian and a bunch of lesser known ones as well. But the fact is you weren't really trained deeply in anything um, beyond uh, 
Kabbalistic, uh, beyond uh, cognitive behavioral. I wish I'd been trained in Kabbalistic psychology in grad school. Uh, but you're not really trained um, deeply or exposed deeply to other more what we might call depth psychology traditions, such as the Jungian or transpersonal traditions. Um, so where that left me in graduate school was um, uh, kind of empty, <laughs> honestly, kind of dry. I wanted a theory of life and of humanity that had space for mystery and wonder and uh, transpersonal aspects of, of life, generally. Um, I had been exposed to Carl Jung many years earlier, of course, and was actively interested in, in Jung and building a lot of my work around, uh, and my training around him and his work, but... Um, what I realized I needed at that time was a, a path of uh, depth and mystery that went beyond that and could be applicable to a, a personal spiritual journey. So I uh, found my way eventually to uh, some of Regardi's writings, Israel Regardi, um, and in particular the book called The Middle Pillar. And in The Middle Pillar, which is a wonderful book I highly recommend, in any edition that you can find of it. Um, and the middle pillar Regardi lays out the theory of Kabbalistic psychology, how it applies to the tree of life, how it can be defined and understood in terms of our inner lives. And uh, this blew my head off. I was amazed at, you know, I, I knew I was interested in magic, but that reading this and reading how the, uh, the psychological worlds and the magical worldview could be superimposed and work harmoniously together. And in fact, to discover that there was in Kabbalistic psychology in, in the tradition itself, um, not just in Western magical interpretations of it, a, a very detailed and uh, nuanced view of the human psyche that I had not encountered anywhere else. Um, and that kind of leads me back to the question of why would we want to pursue this and understand this at all as magicians, and especially as Thelemic magicians. The answer to that is that I think that the processes that are described in Kabbalistic psychology and the, as I said, nuances of the system allow us to talk about and work with our inner life in a higher, um, with a higher degree of specificity than almost any other system I've encountered. And this is even more so than some systems of depth psychology that, you know, certainly get a lot more attention and have been worked out and fleshed out quite a bit over the past century, like the Freudian and Jungian approaches. But um, with Kabbalistic psychology, we have the opportunity to not only get a nuanced and detailed understanding of how the human mind works and the human psycho-spiritual self works. But we, because it overlaps with the tree of life, we can build that right into our understanding of what we are pursuing in our path of attainment. So the ability to use the same language of the psyche, describing the psyche, as we are using to describe our path of advancement on the tree of life, like in a degree-based uh, initiation system, for example, such as AA or double silver star or anything based on the tree of life. Um, the fact that those languages overlap and those models overlap so nicely is uh, a, a huge help in uh, pursuing our work. Furthermore, in terms of the Thelemic magician and his or her approach to the path and why Kabbalistic psychology would be important. The, the nature of the Kabbalistic psychological model gives us insight into the nature of true will. That is, it gives us an opportunity to understand the functioning of true will as it manifests and presents itself to us at all the levels of our psyche, physically, unconsciously, consciously, superconsciously. Furthermore, and importantly, 
when we understand the implications of the Kabbalistic psychology model to our path of attainment and path of initiation, we can see some implications about what the human psyche should evolve, should be evolving into in the new aeon. And I'm going to start you off with some discussion of that at the end of today's episode and then follow through with each subsequent episode as we discuss the different parts of the soul. And the slant I'm going to take on that is that when we discuss each part of the soul, I'm going to be talking about the the fullness of manifestation of that part of the self in the new aeon and the right relationship between the parts of the soul and the new aeon. So what does the balanced, fully realized new aeon magician look like viewed through the lens of the parts of the soul? So I hope that'll be an interesting and, and fun discussion for you. Before I say anything else uh, today, I want to back off for a second and address the probable criticism that I can imagine will come this way um, when these episodes are released. Uh, and it's just the same one I've, I've heard over and over again over the years. And that is that when I talk about magic or when people have found out that I am a magician and a psychologist, talking about magic, there's often an assumption, which is erroneous, that I am saying that magic is all in the head or that the psychological model of under, uh, that a psychological model of understanding magic uh, is somehow implies that, um, that it's a full explanation or the only explanation or the right explanation. Um, to me, this is kind of silly, but I understand, I guess, why some people might go there um, in the sense that uh, you know you can imagine someone trying to assert that oh magic is is all in the head it's just a transformation of psyche there are no real entities out there that we're dealing with spirits aren't real it's, you know even Crowley himself in some of his early writings talked about uh, the goetic spirits for example as as parts of the brain later evolving to a different perspective but um, the the point is we can have multiple perspectives on any topic, right? I mean, the laws of physics have something to say about human life. Psychology has something to say about human life. Mathematics has something to say about the tree of life. And none of those models are, when we talk about them, are, are asserting that they are the only way to look at something. So when I talk about Kabbalistic psychology or anything regarding the overlap of magic and psychology, I want it to be understood that I'm presenting a vantage point on it. And by no means is my personal belief or experience that everything that happens to us can be reductionistically described only in terms of psychology. Uh, I simply, that simply doesn't jive with my own experiences in and the application of magical principles and, and the path of attainment. So I uh, wanted to put that out there so everyone could hear me say it in uh, a definitive way. I might add, too, that it's kind of ironic that someone might levy that complaint against the Kabbalist, Kabbalistic psychology model, uh, claiming it to be a reductionist uh, look at magic when the model itself contains the transpersonal elements that a uh, that a magical worldview would encompass you know the the transpersonal aspects of self that go beyond what we would think of as um, the mind the individual mind so the Kabbalistic psychology model has enough space in it and demands actually uh, an understanding that there are superconscious realms of universal existence that go beyond individual human mind and that have plenty of space for other entities um, external to ourselves that we would be interacting with uh, through our magic. So 
there. I wanted to add that too. Now let's move on to looking at uh, the, the parts of the soul themselves. Um, and what I'm doing today in this episode is a, an overview, just a real brief sort of call out to the different parts of the soul. These will be fleshed out in much more detail with the whole episode for each one coming up, as I said before. So for this, if you're unfamiliar with these terms and you want to have the diagram as a reference, again, you might want to have the, the diagram from the livingthelima.com resources page, the two diagrams there um, in front of you as I'm talking. Um, we're going to start with a brief overview of the Jungian model of the self, just to define some terms that may be useful in their overlap with Kabbalistic psychology terms. So uh, look at the diagram if you need to. You have the tree of life in front of you, and um, obviously Malkuth is the physical body. Uh, this is the Jungian model, of course. And um, while Jung didn't talk explicitly, typically in, in Kabbalistic terms or in terms of the tree of life, I'm overlaying the Jungian model on the tree with this discussion. So the personal unconscious of Jung's theory, those aspects of unconscious that are unique to our individual life, things we have either experienced in our lives and then put down into the unconscious and we're not thinking about and not conscious of at the moment, that's personal unconscious. Things we have never been conscious of, about our own internal dynamics, that's personal unconscious, and all the personal unconscious I attribute to the sphere of Yesod. Uh, the Jungian concept of the ego, that is the everyday self that thinks of itself as the I that goes out into the world and does things. I went to work, I drove the car, I have this kind of personality, I like this, I dislike this, our memories, our intellect, our emotions, our intuition, our senses, all of that in the psyche is, at its conscious level, is the ego. And so on the tree of life, the Jungian ego encompasses the five spheres of Gabura, Chesed, Tefereth, Od, and Netzach. Then, uh, in the Jungian model, the unconscious has a collective aspect, right? The collective unconscious. And that, on the tree of life, I'm putting above the abyss. In other words, the supernal triad. That the unconscious, the, the fact that we are unconscious of it makes it unconscious, but it is transpersonal. It is a realm of collective and objective mind that is shared by all humanity and accessed via individual experience, uh, played out in the field of individual experience, consciously or not, but rooted in collective uh, species-wide experience and, and mind. So that collective unconscious we place above the abyss. Okay, so having laid out the Jungian model on the tree, let's talk about the Kabbalistic psychology model itself. So the, the model describes um, four primary parts of the soul. Some have component parts, we'll go into that, but four basic uh, components of the parts of the soul that um, essentially represent the entire spectrum of consciousness and existence from uh, the highest ineffable levels of cosmic consciousness and creative power, the divinity itself, down to the physical world and the crystallized manifest physical body and the, and the physical world we live in. So the, the model is aligned with the concept that every human has within themselves the uh, essentially a, a full tree of life that the human existence implies a continuum a hierarchy of of awareness and uh, consciousness and power that extends from the highest to the lowest and i'm not using high and low as pejorative terms but as high meaning 
more ineffable, low meaning, more crystallized and manifest. So this is one of those ways that having the Kabbalistic psychology model as a language we can use as magicians is so important because it implies many of the doctrines that we hold to be true in terms of the function of a magician to be a microcosm that by working with itself and its consciousness can affect the macrocosm can uh, mirror, mirror and be mirrored by the macrocosm so looking at the parts of the soul more specifically and again i'm just doing some call outs here for the names to get you familiar with them refer to the diagram um, starting at the top so kether on the tree of life is what is sometimes called yekida okay uh, this is the as you might expect with kether this is the the one source of creative power the uh, the star self the, the the point of contact between uh, human consciousness and divine consciousness and in fact the point at which these are undifferentiated that uh, they are they are as one at Hokma we have the Kia and this is an extension of force again in keeping with what you might expect from Hokma that uh, it is uh, the beginnings of uh, forceful manifestation of this creative power represented by Gether uh, you might think of it as the the universal will uh, beginning to to manifest in 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 form and, and force especially force in this case and then at Bina we have uh, Neshama Neshama is the you know Bina is understanding right so Neshama as Bina in the parts of the soul is the container for the force of Hia coming from Hokma. So all three uh, supernals together uh, form a unity of, of consciousness that in its totality is also called the Neshama. So again, while we have Kether as Yekida, Hokma as Kia, and Bina as Neshama, the totality of the triad is also called Neshama. So the super consciousness is Neshama. Spiritual, uh, spiritually awakened and and uh, enlivened super consciousness is Neshama. You'll note that since it's the supernal triad, we are also there's an implication here that that Neshamic consciousness, if you want to call it that, um, is is transpersonal is is trans abyssal so that fits with our understanding of what the uh, attainment of bina means in the context of the magical path of aa that this is a transcendence of the limitations of individual consciousness and an immersion in the collective mind of the universe that goes well beyond anything we've previously known so that fits very well with uh, what we know of the tree, what we know of the magical path, and what Kabbalistic psychology says about the parts of the soul and their subparts above, uh, above the abyss. Now, we've got Neshama, super consciousness. Now let's look at what's just below that, the Ruach. The Ruach, which means breath, uh, as in the breath of life or the breath of consciousness, um, comprises the same five spheres that the Jungian ego uh, comprises. And obviously Neshama uh, is in the, that collective consciousness realm that we looked at with the Jungian model. So the Ruach is Chesed, Geburah, Tefereth, Netzach, and Hod, centered in Tefereth. And the Ruach is correspondingly that, that everyday human personality awareness that we carry with us. The fact that it's centered in Tefereth can teach us something about the nature of 
what the human mind is that uh, uh, more on this when we have the Ruach episode, but the, the fact that Tefereth is like a communication center. So this, the spiritually centered human is receiving inputs from all of the other spheres of the Ruach, uh, intellect, emotion, memory, will, all of that pulled together and the data collated. And then if we're living from our center in that sense, then our action, our belief, our, our uh, way of, you know, doing something with all these sensory inputs is that's a decision made by, by the, the center of the Ruach at Tefereth. Next, we have the Nefesh. And you may not be surprised to hear that the Nefesh uh, is sometimes called the animal soul and is uh, associated with Yesod in this model. So that's the, the personal unconscious of Jung, but it's also um, all of the instinctual drives and impulses that we would associate as being in the unconscious, that the animal soul meaning the part of us that is living from that place of animal consciousness urges and drives towards uh, procreation, the generativity that but we also associate with Yisod. Um And in this sense, the Nefesh is also what we might think of as the, psychologically speaking, as the inner child. I hate to use a cliche term like that, but it's the childlike part of us that isn't limited by um, sort of higher reasoning and, and executive function that we would associate more with the Ruach. So it's almost like the model that shapes up with Kabbalistic psychology is that we have an inner parent, adult, child thing going on. Um, and we have to find the right way of, of having all these parts interrelate where the nefesh is the child that needs to be nurtured and treated well and cared for and listened to, <laughs> not suppressed and not abused. The ruach is the adult self that needs to function and deal well with other adults, other humans, uh, deal with the outer world. You know, the ego and the ruach are our, our uh, interface between the inner and the outer. And then the parent uh, as the neshama not in the sense of, um, as, as we'll see when I talk about the Neshwa, not in the sense that spirit is this deity on a cloud that we need to relate to in a parental way, like in the old aeon, but more like the part of us that we really want to identify with as running the show is the part of us in super consciousness that is inherently linked to the divine. And that comes back to why this is so important to understand in terms of true will. That if we are tapped in to neshamic consciousness, if that is alive in us, even subconsciously, uh, then we are more likely to be working and living in harmony with, with our true will. So again, a lot more on that when we get to neshama. Finally, uh, I'm not going to do a whole episode on this one, but the goof usually rendered as G-U-P-H, is the physical body connected with Malkuth. And uh, it doesn't take too much explanation or imagination to know what that's about. However, um, there is some very interesting stuff to explore when it comes to the overlap and interface between the Nefesh and the Goof, which says a lot about both uh, and about the way the magician psyche can function. So more on that on the individual episodes. So um, I want to close by setting you up for an overarching story that I'm going to be trying to tell with these episodes that I hinted at in, in my introduction earlier. And that is, how does the evolved new aeon human being function when it comes to the interplay of the parts of the soul. So to, to talk about this and, and set you up for it, think of it this way. Uh, mystery schools over 
the centuries, the, the body of initiates that have, in whatever tradition, in whatever location, in whatever age, uh, have been working, the intent has been to evolve humanity. And I think the effect has been to evolve humanity. Mystery schools always teach the next step in humanity's evolution. Now, in the last aeon, I think it could be argued that this next step involved the cultivation of a fully functioning Ruach. Um, in, in the emergence of civilized humanity, you know, in its cultures, um, one of the struggles that, you know, has been ever present and uh, uh, has, has been the focus of humanity's evolution in those days has, has been recognizing that we don't have to live purely from animal drives and instincts. That, for example, if we are angry and we, feeling like, and we feel like punching somebody, it's still an option. You know, we don't, we don't have to get angry, get scared, feel trapped, and punch somebody. We could stop ourselves and say, hmm, is this the best thing? What are the consequences if I do this? Will it affect my job? Will my family be in danger? You know, we have that higher reasoning that we can apply. And what I've just described is something about the relationship between the nefesh and the ruach. So the nefesh says, I'm angry, punch him. The ruach says, hang on a minute, let's consider. Okay, so in the old aeon, a lot of humanity was still kind of figuring that out. And unfortunately, maybe some still are. Um, figuring out that we can govern our nefesh and put it in right relationship with uh, the Ruach. Um, so in the old Aeon, unfortunately, one of the byproducts of this, as it was happening in, you know, concurrently with the emergence of Judeo-Christian cultures and belief systems and oppressive monolithic orthodoxies, uh, one of the, the byproducts was that the solution offered was, okay, Ruach, if you want to control that bad little child, Nefesh, with all its urges towards sex and violence and dirty things like that, you need God. You need Daddy God on a cloud who's going to help, uh, help you suppress these nasty, evil parts of yourself. And so essentially what old Aeon, uh, exoteric certainly, and to some extent esoteric traditions taught, is ways of calling to God to help us master the nefesh. In other words, the projected, we projected Neshama onto external deities, viewed as external sources of power and comfort and safety and then came to believe that the only way we could manage ourselves as individuals was through this external aid. So the whole thing of Jesus saving you is a perfect example of that. You know, you can't just take care of yourself, uh, be your own master in that sense. Um, you need Jesus slash God. So, um, Hence, uh, a lot of old aeon ceremonial magic and initiatory ritual mirrored that. You see a lot of emphasis on piety to an external god, uh, and even uh, grimoires, you know, emphasizing the importance of uh, accessing uh, an apparently external god for help with the process. Um, so the implication was only this god can redeem us from the temptations of the nefesh and teach us how to maintain the stability of the Ruach. Uh, now, at this point, we kind of got that for the most part. We get that, you know, we understand the fight or flight response. We understand that you've had these psychology classes, right? You know, in order to calm ourselves and not just be reactive and, and go into fight or flight mode whenever we're upset or threatened, um, we can use our minds to calm ourselves down, relax our bodies, uh, and get out of that reactive place. So, you know, 
we got Ruach down pretty well, and obviously we don't have any trouble being uh, highly cultured, civilized, brainy people when we need to be, and when we're uh, able to be based on physical safety. So the next step is really, well, the next step is to ask, the next step for us today is to ask, what is the next step? What might human consciousness evolve into that would reflect a further development of the parts of the soul and their relationship to each other? So in other words, if we, if we have well established how the Ruach can take care of the Nefesh and uh, you know, master some of those impulses, and we look back on people who didn't know that. We look back on earlier stages of, of human evolution where uh, people might have believed that they needed, to, that there was no choice but to act on act on these impulses. That sort of animal level of consciousness. That seems pretty primitive, right? Like, oh, they didn't know about fight or flight. They didn't know that they could question these impulses and so on. So I think the same sort of wonder and uh, amusement, really, that we might look back on that with uh, pity even. I think 500 years from now, humans are going to look back on us now and wonder why we didn't get that we are divine created beings that have divine power to shape our universes and uh, not be subjected to uh, a belief or oppression by some imagined uh, external deity that is our only hope in controlling ourselves. So, in other words, forging the right relationship between Ruach and Neshama. And I'm going to explore this model of human evolution across the individual episodes, the next three, and show how, by understanding capitalistic psychology and its implications, we get some answers to the stages that we can move ourselves through in our path of individual attainment to get to that place where we are centered in Neshama as our core identity and no longer limited by the vision of the Ruach. That, in a nutshell, is the point of doing all of this. So I hope uh, my somewhat long-winded way of describing this is, is uh, opened some doors and, and got, got you doing some, some questioning rather than... Uh, just belaboring it. Um, and so again, the next three episodes will cover uh, Nefesh, Ruach, and Neshama in sequence and continue fleshing out this model of uh, New Way on Evolution. So thanks very much for your attention uh, today, and I hope that uh, you got something useful and interesting out of this introduction. As always, if you have any comments, questions, uh, suggestions for future future episodes, uh, anything like that, feel free to send it to me at david at livingthelima.com. Don't forget about the resources available um, at livingthelima.com in terms of uh, readings and demonstration videos and such. The Living Thelema YouTube page is always there as an archive of uh, all of the previous episodes of Living Thelema. And, uh, of course, if you want further structured training in this sort of thing, you can contact the AA at onestarinsight.org and the Temple of the Silver Star at totss.org. Uh, Temple of the Silver Star in particular has uh, a training system that is very conscious of and, and takes pains to integrate these lessons from Kabbalistic psychology in its training. So might be useful to explore for you. So thanks again for listening. Love is the law. Love under will.